I was going up and down the elevators and I, I was on the lobby level and there's another set of elevators that goes down and I think I was getting some Uber Eats. <laughs> and I noticed someone and I stopped and I said to myself, I know who that is. And it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen often. And I was like, I know who that is, I know who that is. But I'm gonna come right back. I had to go downstairs. <laughs> and then I came back up and they were gone. And I was like, shit, that was Kathy Wood. <laughs> What's up, Point Four listeners? Welcome to another special Friday episode where we highlight the business side of sports and culture. Today's conversation, we're kicking off Women's History Month with some real fire as we sit down with Kathy Wood, the founder of Arc Invest, which invests in innovations like self-driving cars and genomics, and is currently valued at $60 billion. Don't forget, we are giving out free game both Wednesdays and Fridays. So follow at Point Forward and subscribe to the pod wherever you get your podcast. Point Forward. We got an opportunity to go down to Tampa, um, the New Bay, as they call it, and see Arc at his Idea Summit uh, at the new ARC Innovation Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. Shout out to Mo Spates. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to remember how did I fall into Kathy Wood. I think I was just watching CNBC a lot. Yeah. And she just kept popping up. And I just followed her on Twitter because, oh, that's what happened. It was around that time where um, I got really interested in uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, NFT space, and I was just like introduced to um, Dapper Labs, which has NBA Top Shot. And so part of my due diligence was to find like the, the brightest and smartest people in that space. And so I just follow them on Twitter. And so I'm just, that's how I get information, just follow people who are leading the space and just figuring out what they're talking about, anything that they have article on. So I would just see her a lot on CNBC and the things she was talking about, you know, and she's been in Tesla for quite some time. Uh, she's in uh, UiPath, which a good friend of mine works at. Um, and she was just in a lot of like innovation and technology companies. And so I just start following her. And then once it's like, it was like Beyonce, Sasha Fierce. She got a cult that follows her as well. So I'm reading comments, what people are saying. And that's how I, you know, pretty much found her. And then as time goes on, you see some of the different things that she's doing and seeing some of, I mean, you spoke about this, some of the commentary that, uh, it's thrown her way, you know, some people, you know, they built entire markets against her. Yeah. You know, I was speaking about that. You were saying, you know, how, you know, what's it like to lose a bunch of money? And and I was explaining how, you know, the system doesn't like disruptors and she's disrupted everything yeah. with how she's introducing investment vehicles to people who don't normally have access to it, yeah. especially with her $50 fund where you can invest $50 or $500 and she's raised what 50 million mm-hmm. off that which is like unheard of mm-hmm. and so they've built these markets to try to you know throw her off the throne but uh she's been able to bounce back um you know she she's she's just brilliant she's a genius you know i hope people are uh able to learn about her and and, and lock in with her um separate from the other guy that was down in florida or the bahamas uh that we spoke about before but um, i think you were able to see her and just speaking to our people like you know why do we think it's important that folks have financial literacy? And before we dive into it, I remember going to that dinner with you uh, at All Star back in Cleveland in, like, 2022. I remember Robert Smith had asked maybe Michael Rubin or somebody. He's like, could you answer this question for me when we're talking about funds and everything? He's like, they'll set up certain funds and certain things to really where an individual who worked this money up and built his way in, he can't get in there. Robert but Smith. Yeah, Robert Smith, but some stoner whose granddad left him a bajillion dollars and never worked a day in his life and, you know, can go off and do all this off-the-wall stuff, can have an opportunity to jump in this fund and stay afloat. Yeah, call it an accredited investor. Yeah, so then when you sit there, he's like, I guess one thing that's occurring is appreciating, you know, you, you comprehend as gatekeepers for everything. But Kathy being a one person to, you know, be able to open the gate. And like uh, with our barber, John, you know, Osiami, when he got crazy about it and he was screaming her praises and everything, it's like, yo, I, to see that transform in a span of a year and a half or two years and really see like, hey, here goes both sides of it. And to me, the ally is unbelievable. 
to me, is just, you know, a responsibility to us all. And it's interesting because maybe I don't understand how capitalism works, but I would assume the more that people that participate in it, the, the better the system works. But it seems as if we treat the system as if it's the haves and have-nots. And so, you know, in order to gain, you got to take that's what it feels like. And so we keep people at a place where they can, they don't even get a chance to participate. And, and it's like they're, you know, it's just like. But it's classism. is Yes. I don't want to say it's colorism, but it's like how do you feel special if everybody has the same thing as you? we already doing participation awards. Yes. You can't even say who's the different or who's the best. Or you can't even, nowadays, you might look at you and I got to listen. And it's no disrespect to anybody, but you have to, you know, somewhat, they're trying to keep the, the lines blurred for as much as possible. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's the tough part. Well, that's just, you know, uh, uh, separation thing, you know, you know, divide and conquer, I should say. And so, As I started back in 1619 or before that and kept, you know, we keep seeing remnants of it. There it is. Every blue moon. But we keep bringing that up. Um, I, I just think it's important, you know, even as we, you know, we try to hold ourselves to a standard where we want, a, you know, a lot of athletes to um, – take in some of this information and really apply it and not just apply it, but teach it as well. And, you know, Kathy is just dropping so many gems on us. You know, I, I'm always at peace in two places, whether it's on the golf course or when I'm just getting game from somebody, um, whether it's some of the smartest minds in the world or people who have solved some of the most complex problems. Um, you know, we talk about the Robert Smiths, we talk about the Kathy Woods, we mm -hmm. talk about the Brett Taylors. Uh, I had a crazy conversation with him, and it was just like, bro, this dude is just on another level. Or it can be just like, I think some of, like all of us have that genius in us. And, you know, you always show me love, but I don't think you understand. Like you said, like six things today. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm running with this one. You it was just like. like it, it, and it's so, you want to know what's so crazy, bro? Usually I toot my own horn like a mother. <laughs> but I'm getting to a level where I'm becoming quotable, bro. I ain't going to lie. I'm not. So I thought about that. I'm like, damn, I'm at that level, G. I just got to give it to somebody else. So you take it and then just give me the credit later. Right? So Pause. That it would be something that I would love for um, our listeners to uh, tap in with us on. I want all, all our listeners to, if you have your favorite ET quote, your ETism, we're starting to do it now. But we're so many episodes in. How many episodes are we in? It's we're like, in the 80s, 90s? Oh, we, we got 100 in? Oh, 100. Oh, we'll be at 100 in May. So we're going to celebrate our centennial. Centennial? Is that mm -hmm. even the word? Episode. Man, that sounds like 500, G. Out of all the stuff, bro, it was an uphill battle, fam. And for y'all, I'm glad y'all watching. But, God, damn, at one point, we like, damn, y'all appreciate shit. <laughs> I hope y'all are uh, enjoying the listen and getting some some game uh, that applies to life. And um, it's uplifting, too. I think that's, that's what E.T. has done for me. I hope he's doing it for y'all. It's just like, you know, like self-awareness in terms of like w how you want to embody yourself. And if you're sticking true to yourself, everything will work out. That's the one thing that I keep reminding myself of. So without further ado, our conversation with Kathy Wood. I was in New York one particular evening and this is when I'm doing my uh, cross country what would you call them expeditions on my dual roles mm -hmm. um, as uh, acting executive director of NBA Players Union uh, Association and uh, obviously as a uh, venture capitalist uh, investing uh, with my firm Mosaic and I was going up and down the elevators and I, I was on the lobby level and there's another set of elevators that goes down and I think I was getting some Uber Eats. And I noticed someone and I stopped. And I said to myself, I know who that is. And it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen often. And I was like, I know who that is. I know who that is. But I'm gonna come right back. I had to go downstairs. <laughs> and then I came back up and they were gone. And I was like, shit, that was Kathy Wood. <laughs> <laughs> Darn it. And so I got on my phone, but in that moment, I thought to myself, I'm understanding like, who I'm becoming. Because most of the time, like, you only, you, you only recognize certain individuals, certain figures based upon your surroundings, based upon your interests, you know, law of attraction. And 
I realized in that moment, like, okay, I'm becoming who I want to become because I'm recognizing individuals that, you know, I aspire to, you know, oh. move in those realms. Oh, my goodness. And I went to Twitter and I made some type of comment in the sense of never would I have thought, you know, 20 years ago that I would be shell shocked and nervous to approach Kathy Wood because I just <laughs> recognized her. <laughs> oh my and so the tweet goes out and get some response from your team. Then you respond and uh, we make this whole thing happen. And so that was, that's a story to tell. Yeah. Um, so can I just tell my side of that story? Yes. So um, I didn't see, the, I probably was in my phone going up or down the escalator, but uh, when I think it was Matt Stout on our team found that tweet and announced it in the morning meeting. The whole place went up. What? <laughs> it's like, I said, okay. Um, I, I'm not a big. I don't watch a lot of basketball. I watch football. I watch football because my son played football. Mm -hmm, so, oh, nice. um, and I watch volleyball too. My daughter played volleyball and. Oh. Uh, the other played softball and so but b basketball was kind of just like a hobby for all of them and so I, I wasn't glued to the but when everybody heard your name Andre Iguodala and I I had to rehearse the name because I I, I did <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I realized what well, the same thing I realized wow you know what by giving away our research by you reaching out to your community mm -hmm. and uh, imparting your wisdom, your wisdom coming both out of athletics but now out of investing, mm -hmm. what we get back, both of us, is, is so much more. The gratitude we get and also, um, and also the, the um, reaction to our investments you know mm -hmm. you we, sometimes we live in these echo cha chambers and that's the biggest thing we have to guard against is that we're not in an echo cha chamber if if i think something's great that everybody just doesn't play that back to me no being out there you know people want us i mean there are always haters but there are m more more people who want us to do well mm -hmm. i think and are trying to say well you know, have you thought about this? Or have, they're battle testing our ideas. So it's it's a win-win. And, you know, I think you're excited uh, about the venture side of the world mm -hmm. because of how transformative these technologies are going to be. And you can lead people towards mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. which is really mm -hmm. exciting. And I, I, I want to dive into that. And I think Evan, you know, from the communities that we come from, and not having the ability to participate in, you know, whether how these companies are being built or being able to participate in investing in these things. And obviously, you know, you're going to share with us how you've turned five hundred dollars into fifty million. <laughs> and uh, we want to dive into that as well. But just for the folks who may not know, you know, Kathy Wood of Arc Innovation, um, you know, in terms of disruption, uh, in terms of uh, future technologies. Uh, how we apply those to our, our daily lives for, uh, you know, innovation is the key to sustainability, Yeah. <laughs> especially with how we're, you know, we're ruining our earth. Um, talked about flying commercial. Yeah. <laughs> People are very surprised when they see me in the airport. I get a lot of shoulder taps, like a lot of that happens a lot. Uh, <laughs> and he gets it as well. Um, but for the folks that don't know um, what you've done, I see you three times a week on CNBC People are always surprised that I don't watch too much TV. Um, but just, you know, the Michael Jordan of your world. Oh, uh, gosh. But <laughs> it, 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 there's there's no better way to introduce somebody than to say the Michael Jordan of their world. And just want to welcome you to the show. Uh, want to give the insights to our listeners on your background, uh, how you've become who you become, and, and, and what's next. And, you know, how can they be more involved um, in, you know, innovating and helping with uh, pushing along innovation in the world that we live in today. And benefiting from it. You yes. Know, getting, we often say get on the right side of change mm -hmm. and then stay there and ride the wave. Mm -hmm. And you know what's so interesting about today is 
and we've talked about education before, Andre. Yes. Yeah, is just inspiring young people that, hey, look what these technologies are going to do. And you could ride that wave. Mm -hmm. This could change your life completely because innovation levels the playing field. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not, when we first started ARC 10 years ago, uh, colleges weren't teaching blockchain technology. It was, mm -hmm. it was considered almost, um, I don't know, uh, for, uh, again, people were dismissing it because of criminal activity. I mean, they were completely right. dismissing yes, yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, we weren't. We were saying, no, wait a minute. This is the part of the internet that developers forgot to build in mm -hmm. in the early 90s when they were evolving it because no one thought commerce or financial activity would take place on it. So those young people, and it was mostly young people mm -hmm. who, who, who understood that, they, they're natively digital and they knew that, uh, and then they started studying it. You know, they have done really well, just to give you a sense of this. In 2015, well, we wrote our first blog the first year we were we opened ARC in 2014. 2015, Bitcoin was $250, mm -hmm. right? And we wrote a, a paper about, uh, and it was in collaboration with Art Laffer, uh, about uh, Bitcoin. Could this really serve the three roles of money? And uh, with Art Laffer, we answered yes. And once we got that seal of approval from an economist who's a monetary scholar, we said, okay, we have to do something with this. We have to run hard with this. And we've been running ever since, um, but it's gone from $250, $250 to $43,000. And we still think it's just begun uh, because institutions are just now becoming involved. Uh, so it, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, we think it could scale. Mm -hmm. Depends on the, you know, we have a base case, a bear case, a bull case, but uh, it could scale from 43,000 to 650,000 or $1.5 million per coin or even higher as institutions get in. But the most important thing is we talk about these, these, these themes is be prepared for huge volatility. Mm -hmm. You know, there's yes. the hypes, and yes. you know, so there are the booms and the busts and the booms and the busts. The trend line should be up, but you have to prepare, especially young people, for volatility. So you pretty much coined the phrase uh, disruptive innovation. Yes. So can you describe that in a definition and why you believe in that so much? That's kind of, you know, yeah. Your go-to if you're going to be MJ. It's like the fadeaway to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Well, um, it, I don't think we coined the expression, but we are activating yeah. it. So the seeds for everything that is happening today were planted uh, in the 20 years that ended in the tech and telecom bubble, right? And then there was the crash. So all the seeds were planted there. But the reason the crash happened is because the technologies were not ready. And even if they were mm -hmm. kind of getting ready, the costs were prohibitive. So just to give you a, a good example of the, the second one, um, in 2003, but we were thinking about it in the late 90s, in 2003, the first whole genome was sequenced. We were able to understand all of the six billion bits of code in one person's body mm -hmm. and so that we could understand what was going wrong. That cost $2.7 billion just for one person. And it took 13 years of computing power. Mm -hmm. We were not ready for prime time, but biotech was a big part of that bubble, right? Uh, the technologies weren't ready. We didn't get the cloud until 2006. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the two very big breakthroughs in AI, deep learning in 2012, and then transformer architecture in 2017-18. Uh, th those technologies were not ready for prime time back then, but capital flowed aggressively into them and shouldn't have. Today, they are ready for prime time. We are starting to scale the five major platforms, which are robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, 
and multiomic sequencing in the life sciences space. And I know, I know, Andre, you have a, a big interest in the healthcare space. Mm-hmm. And that's yes. probably going to be one of the most, uh, the, 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 the sectors most transformed by these technologies. So we believe they're scaling now, but, but, and this is perfect investor psychology, and I'm very comfortable. People are scared. Mm-hmm. They're very, I'm comfortable as a portfolio manager because I would prefer to be investing in something controversial when there's a lot of FUD out there, fear and certainty and doubt. Um, and that's because there's people fearing for their jobs, their businesses, meaning in the financial industry, mm-hmm. and they don't want to be wrong. Well, guess what? If you don't take risks, you're not, if you don't take risks, you're not going to get returns. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to manage, uh, you have to manage those risks and, and manage around the volatility, use it to your uh, benefit. So, yeah. No, it, we, as athletes, we thrive in chaos and we don't realize it until we're thinking back on our careers and all the things that transpired and, um, one of our favorite conversations was with Isaiah Thomas. He said people, uh, most humans react within uh, one or two seconds. Yeah, yeah, one or two seconds. One or two seconds, but as professional athletes, we react in uh, one hundredth of a second. And so we're calculating risk all the time. All the time. Like every movement, every step, uh, every, every time we analyze a play or what's happening or we're communicating, it's all analyzing risk. And... Can I just say, I think that's why you are a great investor and you will become much more well-known as an investor for that talent. Mm -hmm. You know, because what you're doing is you're sizing up the field or the court, but, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever field we're talking about. And uh, I'll finish off on disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is going to transform the world as we know it today completely in the next five to 10 years. Uh, I think most investors are, uh, are not equipped to do what you're doing, number one. And one of the reasons is because after the tech and telecom bust, that was in the early 2000s, and then even more so after the, the global financial crisis mm-hmm. in 08, 09, They became scared, I'm going back to that. And they began to think, okay, I have to invest in the public markets, I have to invest close to the S&P 500 or close to the NASDAQ or close to the MSCI world. And so their reaction time, that skill set that I learned when there were no computers and no cell phones and no spreadsheets unless we did them by hand, uh, the reaction time that I have to information, which is constant, it's constantly bombarding us, right? Mm-hmm. A little bit like you on the court. Yes. Although I could never be any, like I don't know if the milliseconds that, that I take things in matches yours, but uh, I think we'd make a great team. So. For sure. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, you take all of that information in and uh, you need to make d- decisions quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, the traditional world is losing that talent because it's letting an index lead the way. Indexes are all about what has already happened. Mm-hmm. The stocks at the top of those indexes are there because of their past success. But if we're right on disruptive innovation, that again is going to turn sectors upside down, inside out, people aren't going to recognize them in five to 10 years. That is exactly the wrong way to invest. So taking information in real time, constantly, every day, if you're in the crypto world, or we'll call it more the digital asset world, Mm -hmm. it's 24 seven now. Mm -hmm. So right, it's not just 930 to four, like the equity markets open, it's 24 seven. So now that world is on steroids in terms of this reaction time. So when you left Alliance, uh, was it Alliance? Bernstein. Bernstein yeah. in 2014. You were so sure about the path you were taking to starting up ARC and everything, right? You weren't worried or anything about that? Your mindset was like, I'm just marching towards my goal, my thought, my mindset, and not worry about the risk, correct? Well, what, what happened uh, was August 2012, mm-hmm. uh, I walked into my house uh, in Connecticut, and... Um, 
and it was a beautiful day. It was a sunshiny, beautiful day. And I walked in, and the house, completely quiet. And I'd moved there in 1995. It was 2012. I had never walked into the house like that. And I wasn't happy, and I wasn't sad. It's just three children, two dogs, nanny and uh, assistant uh, were not there and wouldn't be there for a while. And I, and I walked over, and I said, huh. Uh, just walked over to the counter, and then, boom, this idea hit me. You have to, and in my world, I would say that it's the Holy Spirit, but, uh, and others would say it's the force or the universe, but it just came to me. I was not thinking about work. I wasn't really thinking about anything about how beautiful, except how beautiful the day was. And uh, it, basically, it was you have to use technologies that are disrupting the rest of the world and bring them into the financial services industry and disrupt it. It's broken. And it's true. In the public, I really do believe in the public markets for the reason I just described. Mm -hmm. It is broken. And there is not in the public markets, not enough focus on the future. In fact, when I try to explain to someone who's not in our business, um, why I needed to start ARC, because I was becoming such a different duck. Everybody was going to the indexes, yeah. and I didn't want anything to do with them because there were so many exciting opportunities outside of them, right? Well, I want to dive deeper in because uh, you spoke on like a spiritual disposition when you created ARC, and you yes. named ARC after the yeah. ARC of the Covenant. Covenant. Yes, yes. thank you. It like Covenant. a play on... Uh, Different mindset, but on what Moses had to do. Yes. I'm in Exodus 29 right now. Yeah, so oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Did you view yourself in that sense of, we look at Aaron. Aaron was the handsome one, mm -hmm. the most articulate one, right. the one that everybody loved. And then you look at Moses, he walked with a limp. He couldn't yeah. speak well. Yeah, he couldn't speak well. Yeah. Lord, yeah. And you doubt her. I, doubt her, yeah. and ideally, you like, why would people pay attention to me? Yeah. And we look at... Uh, when it comes to finances, you look at like the Wolf of Wall Street and stuff. You oh think of all gosh. those individuals that move like that, but you kind of took a spiritual yes. disposition. So, so how has that faith led you in a sense of absolutely. Uh, believing in everything over top, aside from the index or analytical situations in our field? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so ARC stands for Ark of the Covenant. Thank you. Most people think it st stands for Noah's Ark, yeah. uh, you know, rescuing and all of yeah. that. Ark of the Covenant is what the Israelites took into battle before them. Uh, the presence of God would protect them. That's how they crossed the Red Sea and so forth. And um, I, I believe that this was uh, an idea that inspired, as I said, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so I wanted to name the firm that, but uh, the, the way I came up with the name is at, from 2012, really it was maybe from 2006, just I knew that, 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 that our business, the financial world, was going more towards benchmarks, and it was just like, ah. Um, and so I started just opening the Bible randomly and just saying, God, please talk to me. Tell me what you want me to do, how you want me to do this, um, and, you know, open doors if this is what I'm supposed to do. You know, you trust but verify. You're, that's, that's something we're taught also. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many times when I opened the Bible did I land at Ark of the Covenant? Uh, so many times. It wasn't the same page each time. I think now someone will have to do the research on this, but I, I did hear that Ark of the Covenant is used 72 times in the Bible. I think it probably is more than that, but it's clearly not on every page. It's not. It's not right. even on in every chapter. But yeah. here I just kept hitting on Ark of the Covenant and uh, and reading about it and learning more about it and saying, okay, that's. Uh, if I am going to start a firm, and again, I was just the prayerful. It wasn't just, okay, I'm done and I'm on my way. Yeah. It was, uh, uh, you know, I just um, found a way to extricate myself grace gracefully from, from that firm. And yes, when, uh, I st when I committed, then all in. I've, I've never worked harder in my life. <laughs> you know, by the end of uh, a Friday each week, I mean, 
I was getting four to five hours sleep a night, and then I on the weekends I'd sleep fifteen to eighteen hours. So it was just. Uh, I feel you right now. <laughs> that's, that's me right now. <laughs> but I want to go back to, you know, what part of your foundation do you think has helped you have this type of success? Because we had a great conversation on one of our initial calls. Mm -hmm. And you said you would sneak out the house. Uh, you would sneak out the house, and most teenagers sneak out the house. Like they, and this is a crazy story. So my six-year-old, um, her mom's gonna kill me. Or my wife's <laughs> gonna kill me. My six-year-old um, got an email from school. You know, she's got a lot of energy, and she's in her own world, and she likes to do her own thing. And it's just like, okay, we're trying to solve for this, solve for that. Oh, by the way, last week uh, we couldn't find her. And you know, she's going to school on the campus, and. Um, we were looking over, we we're looking for her. She left the classroom, obviously, and she leaves like that building on the campus. And they found her in the library checking out books. And I, I'm reading like, well, I don't know what, what's wrong here. I, <laughs> I don't see the issue. And, but when we were speaking, it sparked that thought because you said you would sneak out the house yeah. and you would go to the library. I would. I, I, so in my teenage, we were talking about teenage years, I think, mm -hmm. uh, generally, and you know what it was like. And you know, all teenagers are are trying to separate and form their own identities and so forth. And you know, I I loved my parents, and you know, I would never do anything to hurt them, but I didn't want to be around them <laughs> <laughs> at certain times as a teenager. So I'd go to the library, and that was that was my form of rebellion. <laughs> and I'm going to you got something funny to say to no, me no I don't have any no, I, mean, I, I definitely uh, no, I'm, I'm just kind of taken back in a sense of uh, you know right now like just diving deep into like who you are even when you're talking when there's storms or winds like I think like diving to your foundation what's giving you such a, a resilience yeah. like a perseverance to think differently when you mm -hmm. walk into these rooms even when I'm not being it's smart, so I look left or right to see if I said the right thing. But you're yeah. walking in and dealing mm -hmm. with experts and trying to go against the norm as a female and then, you know, playing Robin Hood and bringing along other people. Right. Where it's like, where, you know, how do you, how do you weather that storm? How do you continue to elevate and continue to preach what you believe? Like right now you're talking about fan companies are going to be able to be worth 20 and 50 million, a, a trillion. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It'll be old country's uh, yeah, trillion. Yeah. So Actually, like you understand? Like, yeah. and like, this is what you're speaking out on. Like, go get this because they'll be bringing in 5 to 10 trillion yes. annually. Yes, you'll a, change your life. Yeah. You'll change your family's life. You'll change your community. You'll change the world mm -hmm. if you get on the right side of change. Yeah. So the numbers, if just to put some numbers on this. So... If you look at disruptive innovation in the global markets today, um, they're valued at roughly $19 trillion. This is public and private. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, almost 15% of the total, right? We think that $19 trillion is going to scale to $220 trillion, right? So tenfold in the next seven years. That's how quickly we believe the world is going to change and how if people get on the right side of change, um, you can har you know, harness these technologies and really create a better life for yourself, your families, and, and, and create better communities. Um, I've had uh, a lot of faith since I was born, and you know, I do think faith is a gift. Um, I, going through a few hard times in the early 2000s, um, uh, I doubled down and was influenced, importantly, I'm going to tell you, by uh, my nanny, uh, who's from Brazil and very spiritual, and, uh, you know, taught me more about my own faith. I went to Catholic schools uh, through, through middle school. I went to Catholic schools. But um, she taught me through the, the hardships about uh, f more about faith and you know, if you really do have a lot of faith, and in my case, in terms of the business, you believe you're meeting an unfilled need. You know, the world needs this innovation, mm -hmm. and the traditional world is, has turned its back on this innovation because most of our stocks are not in benchmarks, right? So the world needs us. Uh, we're meeting 
uh, or fulfilling an unmet need, someone told me uh, that uh, he said, well, yes, this is the new creation. Why are we here, right? Procreation, new creation, creating. And that's absolutely what it is. So when times got really tough, and they did, I mean, we, I used to, we're getting very much into the spiritual thing here, but uh, they got pretty tough uh, uh, and to the point where I would go into the bathroom and kneel down and pray. Mm -hmm. And just, I'd have actually evolved a prayer throughout that period, which was mine, you know, just. And um, what happened is I learned that when you go through these hardships, if you're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. if you are fulfilling an unmet need, mm -hmm. if you are part of the new creation, you should thank God for the hardships. Mm -hmm. Thank God. The, he, he likes nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. That kind of faith saying, okay, I'm going through this for a reason. We went through 21 and 22. That was worse than the tech and telecom bust in the early 2000s. And every day I was saying, oh my goodness, you know, how can they be throwing these stocks out when they are creating the new world? And the answer was they were selling our stocks and going back to their benchmarks. And so the, the drop was worse than the NASDAQ te tech and telecom bust mm -hmm. in the early 2000s, which made no sense. It made no sense because the technologies are ready and the costs are low enough. Today, that $2.7 billion to sequence one genome, remember it was $2.7 billion 20 years ago, it's $100 to $200. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and it takes and it takes only a few hours of computing power, not 13 years. That's how quickly the world is changing. I can give you another example. ChatGPT, that really mm -hmm. captured people's imaginations mm -hmm. because they could use it. We were talking we've been talking about AI since we started the firm in 2014 and Nvidia was our primary play on it and mm -hmm. you know no one would listen to us they didn't they didn't know what AI was until ChatGPT and it made a difference in their own lives just to bring to life how fast these costs are falling mm -hmm. so ChatGPT if that had been developed if developer had developed it in 2015 it would have cost roughly $500 million to develop that model. In fact, in 2020, five years later, it cost $450,000. Mm -hmm. Today, it would cost a couple of hundred dollars. That's how quickly things are changing. Costs of AI training costs are dropping 75% per year. And AI inference costs, so using AI, is that's dropping more than 85% per year. So, but why is it why is it so why has it become so expensive to fund an AI startup? I've been watching a lot of these startups mm -hmm. in the AI space. They can't their their cost and their raises are too, becoming too much and so they just essentially become acquired by an incumbent. Yep. And so those are the ones that essentially are going to own so, everything. Yes. So, it's very expen these large language models are getting larger and larger and more expensive to, to build out mm -hmm. and need a tremendous number of GPUs, graphic processing mm -hmm. units, back to NVIDIA, mm -hmm. right? Um, now that we have recognized that cost, what, what companies are doing, they're, they're both private models, some of the ones you're talking about, meaning they're closed, mm -hmm. and then you've got open source models. So if you look at meta platforms, mm -hmm. It's giving away its, its uh, really its large language model capabilities and it's paying for the GPUs supporting it. So I'm very intrigued by uh, your question. It is, what's going to win here? And so what we have done, it's in our big ideas 2024, you'll see a chart and you look at the performance gains of those closed models mm -hmm. and they're, they're, they're definitely increasing but then you look at the performance gains of the open source models. They're moving. They're, they're, the models themselves do not perform as well, but their performance is increasing faster right, okay. than the closed ones. So I think there's a, a big battle. What we're seeing from companies now 
is these um, foundation models like OpenAI and mm -hmm. Anthropic uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and Llama 2, which is uh, meta platforms, mm -hmm. um, our companies, many companies are leveraging off of them. And, and we see that part of the world commoditizing a bit more. They're trying to charge for it now. They're being successful now. But these open source models are improving faster. So it's a dynamic we need to watch. Mm -hmm. GPT-4, um, it took performance in the closed world up another big notch. We're waiting for Meta Platform's next, uh, it'll be Llama 3. Mm -hmm. Does that leapfrog as well, or do the closed models win? So, you know, this is a disruptive innovation. I think the, the ethos, the open source ethos out there, if you look at the internet, that's open source, and look yes. how that proliferated and benefited so many lives. Uh, do we want to close this ecosystem now? Um, I'm, I'm a fan of open source, but we have to keep an open mind saying, and in fact, in our venture fund, we have uh, a venture fund we started about a year ago, we own Anthropic. And when OpenAI went through all the drama, they fired Sam Altman, right. and then they brought him back. Yep. Um, Anthropic was a huge beneficiary. So it's a very fertile and um, uh, uh, volatile uh, existence right now. This is how the internet felt in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking back then, okay, uh, this is going to be big. Uh, what do I need to do with this? And so I th we started studying routers and uh, switches mm -hmm. and headers and what do I need to know? I didn't need to know any of that. I just needed to know Cisco. Cisco was the company that built out the backbone effectively. Yes. I needed to know about the apps that we're going to build on top of it. So we are looking uh, for that. Uh, in, in AI, and I have to say, uh, Palantir reported this week, mm -hmm. and Alex Karp, who's the CEO, uh, believes that Palantir will be the largest AI company in the world. And after looking at their results, listening to, uh, to Alex and his team, I think that might be right. Because what's happening is companies around the world are saying, this is big, and we know we can't be left behind, mm -hmm. and CEOs are getting involved in the decision, not just CTOs. Because there's so many small AI companies that have these, you know, chat bots and point solutions, and, you know, they're depending on others to put them all together. Uh, Palantir is saying, no, you have to look at the organization and, in, and get the data in one place, integrate it, get the workflows. So I think it, it, it could be a big disruptor, and nobody believes this right now, but it could be a big disruptor to Microsoft. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you, said, you also said recently that you believe EFT can become a substitution for... Oh, yeah, ETFs. Yeah, ETFs, I'm yeah. sorry. I'm no so way. sorry, my, yeah, no, for, no. Uh, for Go. And, oh, for uh, gold, yes. Bitcoin, yeah, sure. big, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Bitcoin in particular. Yeah, Bitcoin, yeah. obviously. And could you elaborate on that? Because, you know, obviously gold has been so, you know, loved 5, and valued and worthy. 5,000-year brand, yeah, right? Yeah, like, ever. That's, yeah. uh, I just want to hear more. I just want to... Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Um, a very well-respected uh, investor out there, Stanley Druckenmiller, mm -hmm. usually on opposite ends when uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to innovation, mostly around val uh, valuations, I would say. But um, he said, he said, you know, gold is a 5,000 year old brand. I think it's more than that, but okay, 5,000 years. Uh, Bitcoin is a 10 year brand now. And he said, maybe I should own some. Maybe I should own some because it's performing the same role as gold. Um, it's going to maintain its value because it's scarce, just like gold is scarce. S gold is scarce. Uh, it, the supply of it grows about 1% per year on average over a very long period of time. Uh, when the price spikes, yeah, that percentage will go up because people have more incentive mm -hmm. to mine for more gold. Well, something is going to happen this year with Bitcoin, uh, which means that its supply growth is going to drop below the supply growth of gold. Um, it has been growing 1.8% per year, the number of Bitcoin out there, for the last four years. In April, 
uh, it's going to go through what's called the halving, mm -hmm. H-A-L-V-I-N-G, halving. Mm -hmm. it, that growth rate will be cut in half to about 0.9% for the first time falling below gold. Now, why is Bitcoin a scarce asset? Gold is because it's hard to find right. and hard to mine. Right. Why is Bitcoin? It is because it's mathematically metered to have the growth rate every four years. So in four years, it'll start growing 0.4%, not 0.9% or mm -hmm. 0 0.4. And the number of Bitcoin there will ever be in the world is 21 million. And right now, we're at 19.5 million outstanding. And it's only going to 21 million. If you look at that 19 and a half million, and you can see this, this network's completely transparent, 15 million of that 19 million in, are in what we call strong hands. They have not moved their Bitcoin in uh, more than 155 days. That means they're hodlers. Hold, uh, hodler, it's kind of a joke, yeah. hold on for dear life. Uh, and that was developed in, that hodler was in this 2017. That's so what I'm doing, I'm a hodler. I'm a hodler, motherfucker. So think about that, 15 out of 19.5 hodling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. One and a half million left. Yes. Institutions have just gotten involved. Just gotten the involved. SEC gave it the green light the form in the form of an ETF, and we were one of the 11 launched. We're doing very well, thanks be to God. <laughs> Yay! Yeah, um, yes, uh, so think about that. What does that mean? If institutions really want to be involved, um, they will have to pull <laughs> with pricing uh, the hodlers into selling their Bitcoin. These are two things that I struggle with. And so gentrification is one of them. And so in our community, we do talk about generational wealth. And I do want to speak on your ETF. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you pulled that one off and getting uh, folks who are um, uh, unaccredited, unaccredited investors yes. who aren't allowed to enter the markets. Yes. And you provided that vehicle. And then how the reaction to that is, you know, uh, the lobbyist who like to, you know, inform in a manner that, we, you said it earlier, the haters, that's one of my favorite <laughs> phrases you've used today. Because we experienced that um, based on a location that we played basketball at one point. Uh -huh. We love you though. <laughs> and no, he's one of them. How do you, <laughs> <laughs> and so how do you maneuver around news that can affect your portfolio I want to ask that, that question first, and then I get to the other questions. Yes, so we have a morning meeting every morning. We, the morning meeting starts at 8.45 and usually goes to 10.30. Uh, a little bit of business, company business, mm -hmm. for the first 15 minutes or so. Then it's all research. And uh, our analysts put in to, um, uh, or throw in, anything that's happened overnight or in the last day that has any relevance to anything we're doing. Uh, and what, what's so much fun about what we're doing is we're putting this puzzle together and we're just trying to do it faster than it, just like you on the, on the court. Mm -hmm. um, although I would never compare myself to you. And uh, Michael Jordan, I can't believe you did that because like, I even know like, he is the greatest of the great, although you two are really no, great. Well, no, I was not yeah, on that level. No, 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 you don't have to do that for me, Kathy. I'm on okay. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so uh, anyway, getting there faster. The, what's so fascinating to me is I love watching where manage where talent's going. I follow talent, mm. and I want to know anytime someone leaves one of our companies, and anytime someone, meaning in a, a strategically important position, yeah. uh, and I also believe in follow the developers. So we're trying to evolve metrics yeah. where we follow the de developers. Who's who's migrating to which platform, mm -hmm. you know, faster mm -hmm. and increasing the probability of success of that platform. So people, you know, we talk a lot about technology, but I follow the people. And, uh, and then, of course, um, we get all kinds of clues about competitive dynamics. Uh, and 
you know, we believe that most of the stocks, companies uh, in our portfolio have barriers to entry. They have some competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Now, talk Tesla. We, we're very well known for Tesla. And um, what are the barriers to entry? Well, they are moving battery and drive train technology fast ahead faster than anybody else. Mm -hmm. We can measure that by cost declines. Uh, uh, Tesla is the only company that has auto company that has developed an AI chip. This is he, the, uh, Elon's taking a leaf from Steve Jobs' book at Apple. Apple was the only company that developed. Uh, a, a chip yes. for a smartphone. Uh, Nokia, Ericsson, uh, Motorola, Blackberry, Blackberry, none of them yeah. did that. Why? Because Steve Jobs understood that, that uh, this was the new computer and it would go in our pocket. Those other companies thought computers would stay on desktops mm. and couldn't imagine the miniaturization of the technology. So he just was thinking about the world completely differently. So is Elon. From the beginning, he's been thinking about robo-taxis and how, and, and this is something I tell Uber drivers if you want to, and, and, and because you, you try and think about the people who are going to be displaced by these technologies. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we actually did a seminar uh, once at something called Jericho Partnership. This is the education side of what we do. Mm -hmm. It was on drones. And it was during COVID, and we were talking about how this would take over delivery, food delivery, grocery delivery. You get, you'd get your groceries delivered five, six times a day, seven, eight, nine, whenever you wanted something, because it was going to drop in price. Not today, but out there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember uh, one of the a student was, let's see, this was drawn. So it was 10th, 11th grade, noticed her face she got sad and and said what what what's the matter and she said well my dad's a delivery man and i said okay now you have just learned more about drone technology we did it over seven, six classes and you know more about it than 98% of the people in the world mm -hmm. this was 2020 before yeah. and i said you know, you should go and, and talk to your, your father about this. And we can talk about business ideas. When it comes to Uber, for example, I'll say to the drivers, you know, you should get together with some of your other Uber driver buddies and you should start buying Teslas mm -hmm. because you want to own those fleets when they start going out there without any people in them. Yeah, you and you want to ring the cash my, register. I can take my Tesla and yeah. shoot it out to go pick up people. And yeah, you go, Uber yes, ride. you, Nobody driving. you, you <laughs> drop off, you drop, or the car drops you off yeah. at, at your office or wherever you want to be, and then you can send it out to work for you. Yeah. And we've done, and you'll find it, uh, arc-invest.com, you'll find the research where if you do that, you'll pay off the cars in, depends on how aggressively you use them, but mm -hmm. you know, it becomes very affordable. So there's always a way to harness the information. It might be you need to gather a group of people because you know, it's hard to afford a car, but if you all, yeah. uh, if you all share the costs and then as time goes on and the car starts uh, you know, giving you cash flow, you can buy more cars. You know, so there's always a way with innovation to use it to your advantage and get out of the way. That's one of the things we say. There's going to be so much disruptive innovation. I told you how much opportunity is going to create. The other side of that is creative destruction, yeah. which is, okay, it's going to make a lot of things obsolete, a lot in, in certainly in transportation, even rails. When we get to autonomous trucks, yeah. uh, it's going to undercut rails when when they scale up. Now I'm not talking about tomorrow. It's just that's what I, I highly encourage schools. They well we're, we've developed a program as a curriculum to take ARC's research, make it age appropriate, and this happened here in Pinellas County within the first two years we were here, which w would never have happened in New York, right? right. So may, it takes our research, makes it age appropriate for sixth grade. 
And we are the science curriculum throughout in the public school system throughout Pinellas County. Mm -hmm. And we are beginning to introduce these, this is middle school, so very tender age, right, where uh, they start getting bored with school or whatever. We want to excite them with these mm -hmm. new technologies and excite them about their futures around these technologies because mm -hmm. they're not being taught in the schools. So they ain't being taught African American history either. <laughs> there are a lot of things. That are not. Colleges, colleges are not teaching. This this was true as a few years ago. I don't know if it's still true, but they are not teaching economic history right. because you know history rhymes, and it, it, it and uh, and, like and you have to know what went wrong historically, mm -hmm. not to repeat those mistakes. But uh, I can tell you, I've studied economic history, but it's thanks to Art Laffer. He used to come in armed with all kinds of history. And, and I know that many of the people in our business do not know this history. So you're right, history, critically important. So I know we didn't answer this because you talked about it off mic, but you know, so how did Delaware mess up you know, the Elon Musk decision? Because you said yourself, in order to pull that out, he damn near had to be perfect, and yes. he was. And, Every corner he hit, he hit, and he yes. should be rewarded for that. Yes. So how does that stop the innovation and kind of penalize Elon for basically, you know, going on a limb and, Again, and, and, and rearranging the world? You as athletes understand something that the court system definitely does not understand, right? You just said, I think you said you used a basketball term to, or to describe what he did. What yeah. was that again? <laughs> there were so many terms that came up over here. I call anyway, it EFT. I, I, can see, <laughs> I can see yeah. your athletic mind yeah. in the question. Yeah. So let, let, let me just say that. So he hit. He, he hit. Basically, he hit all his um, his incentive. Yeah, 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 yes. He hit everything. There were twelve hurdles mm -hmm. he had to he had to uh, pass. Mm -hmm. The first one. Now remember, he was not paid a salary, a bonus. No cash, nothing. And he agreed to do that uh, it, until he hit the 12th hurdle, right? So the first, and which was over a 10-year period, the first hurdle that had to happen before he could make any money, uh, and this is the minimum, uh, the, the stock price had to double and he had to meet certain revenue and cash flow targets. And, and he had to meet enough of them. So um, he had to meet, if you combine the revenue and cash flow, he had to meet half of them. And it didn't matter how he met them, but he had to meet the stock price one. So double the stock price if you don't double it. And remember, he was going through production hell. Yes. And we went through it with him. Uh, you know, and there were talk about haters. Why hate this person who is transforming our world uh, and try, trying to save humanity? You know, he became obsessed with battery technology and shifting us from fossil fuels to, uh, to, to battery technology, electricity, and so forth. That is not fossil fuel fuel generated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but but uh, we were going through production hell, and the stock was getting pummeled. It was going in the wrong direction for him. Uh, for that next year, it was in 2019, it, you know, from 18 to 19, I mean, we were, it was extremely volatile, and it was on average going down. So not only had he set the course, but he was going in the wrong direction that first year. Uh, so no salary, no bonus, nothing. And the stock was going in the wrong direction as he was going through production hell. Nobody thought he could do this. Uh, we did. We did. And uh, we were able to model why he was going to be able to do it when others were saying, and this included auto companies, uh, buy, side, uh, uh, buy side analysts, which are on our side of the street, sell side, so the brokers. Uh, nobody thought. I don't think anyone had a positive on his stock. Maybe one or two, but they, they were, uh, people didn't know who they were. So, but we thought they could because we saw how costs were falling in battery technology. 
and uh, saw how he was going to ride down that cost curve, drive prices down, because it was prohibitively expensive at the time to buy an electric vehicle, another reason people thought he couldn't do this. Uh, so we were right. He, think about this, I've just given you the setup there. In the next two years, mm -hmm. first year, wrong direction, mm -hmm. next two years, so the starting point was $21 at the very beginning of the agreement, he got the stock to $400. That was a 20-fold increase in, in two years. For, it, was more, uh, you know, it actually was more than that from the very low. When he was willing to take 10 years, we had him doing it in five years. So we knew it was possible. We knew everything had to go right for him to achieve those targets. And he achieved them in three years from the beginning of the deal. Now, what did Delaware say? This, honestly, this was a political decision. I think it was completely political and un-American. Mm -hmm. Why are you punishing this entrepreneur who is transforming the world? Why are you punishing him? So there, it was very legalistic. Our general counsel read through all 200 plus pages. And uh, basically they said, even though 73% of shareholders voted for that package, they said, okay, that doesn't count. That's un-American. And they said, it doesn't count. We would know. Um, <laughs> that's wild, <laughs> There you go. So that's, that, that's un-American. How, how, how do they come up with that? Oh, you didn't disclose that the, a number of people on your board have benefited from your other companies. Uh, and... You know, it was out there that they had. It just wasn't in that particular proxy. Now, I have known the chair of the board since 2007. Her name is Robin Denholm. She is as straight a shooter and, you know, and, and as full of integrity as any other person. She was the CFO of Juniper Network. So we got to know her as one of the largest shareholders when I was at my previous firm of Juniper Networks. Uh, you know, I trust her completely. And I do have that benefit of, of knowing her and uh, getting to know her through thick and thin, through all kinds of markets. Um, and, and so they really, the court was really struggling to find a reason to dismiss the shareholders. That's un-American. I truly think it is. The other thing, the, the second one was, uh, it was, uh, um, I've forgotten, it's all legalese, but normally the board has a lot of discretion to um, uh, to allow things co to come up for to vote on, mm -hmm. on on and to put votes to shareholders, and um, they basically said in this case no, and it's because Elon is a controlling shareholder, and he had less than twenty percent of the stock. And I said, He's not a controlling shareholder, <laughs> and they said yeah, but he controls them, and it's like. Oh, so you're a mind reader. Is that <laughs> it? Oh, okay. Now we get it. So here's how to understand that pay package. I just gave you one point of view about how hard it was. Yeah. But uh, the way the board, I think, was thinking about it was Elon is the best salesman for Tesla. He's, mm -hmm. he's Tesla's best salesman. They don't even have to advertise, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, so what the board, what the board uh, it did is say, okay, we will do this and effectively pay Elon if he makes the, all of these goals, he'll get an 8% commission or 7 or 8% commission. And Elon said, no, no, I, I, no, not that much. You, you pull that down, pull that down. So effectively it was a 5% commission. If a salesman does think about that if it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's <been>. <laughs> <laughs> i made everybody money i ain't want that that's yeah. crazy and we as shareholders all shareholders benefited enormously this is the most ridiculous court decision now what was very interesting about this is we've just gone through all of this crypto drama with the right. sec right gary gensler chairman gary gensler he was stopping innovation in its tracks as a regulator the court system called him out on it, arbitrary and capricious, not your role. And so 
I was feeling really good about the court system. I was saying, ah, oh, the system of checks and balances that's working. This is America. <laughs> and then we get this decision. I said, this is un-American. You know, this is like, uh, there's a, but we still have checks and balances. He will appeal it. Uh, we will support him again. And we'll be out there fighting for him because it's just wrong. Mm. It's just wrong. Mm. This is stopping innovation in its tracks. What are you doing? Well, in our world, we call that moving the goalpost. There ball, you go. A ball or block. That's right. Ball or block. But right. um, this has been an incredible conversation. Um, really just want to thank you for your time. Oh, uh, thank you. you know, for teaching us, uh, giving us different perspective, uh, insights to our listeners and the communities that we come from. And uh, we just pray uh, that you continue to uh, inspire us, uh, be motivated each and every day, and uh, we're at your disposal. So thank you for having us. And we are at yours. We are at yours. This is going to be a fun journey. We are so aligned. I think when I finished uh, the first call I had with you, um, we're so aligned on investing, mm -hmm on helping people transform their lives through education, uh, especially, and uh, really giving startups uh, an edge with our networks mm -hmm. and our research and, and our guidance, you know. And I would say athletes have a really good vantage point when it comes to this. We've talked a little bit about it, but putting this puzzle together, you have to size the court up. I mean. You say chaos when you use that word when you talk about basketball. I I, I uh, tried to play it when I was in high school. I said this game is too chaotic for me. It's like, I, uh, but but I I do think like an athlete actually oh, sure. because again I'm sizing up, pulling in all kinds of experiences, uh, and you know making decisions very quickly on information that's coming through constantly. Mm -hmm. And some of it's, a lot of it's just noise, fake outs, or whatever you would call it in the right, athletic right, world. Right, right, right. Uh, misdirections. Misdirections. Yes. And, but some of it is you have to, you, you know, this is serious. Okay, I must move now. Right. You know? So, and we make mistakes too. That's the other thing about investing, which is so much so interesting. I was a perfectionist as a student who rebelled against my parents and went to the library. <laughs> and to get into a business where uh, we are not always right, and we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. If you don't take, just think on the court, if you didn't take some of the risks you took, you wouldn't have been the winning teams you were. You just wouldn't. Right. You just wouldn't. And it's the same in investing. Well, to that, thank you. Evan, Evan would disagree with your last point. Um, taking risks because we just got Kevin Durant and there were no more risk. <laughs> <laughs> we just we won. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's an understatement. <laughs> but thanks again. We appreciate it. Thank you. you.